Thank you for visiting Pastor Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWire.com. It's thousand words fighting back, coming down to the finish. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this is one stunning picture. Thousand words just in front. Thousand words wins the Robert B. Lewis. Honoree P is full out now, second on the outside. And they're coming down to the line, and thousand words has done it. Everybody, Dan Oman here with some exciting news. The RF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING, get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free Formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free Formulator exclusively on DRF Bets. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pastor Wyatt TV. We've got a one-on-one -on -one with uh, John Court, who I feel very, very fortunate to have on the show. Um, first off, John, thank, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. I, I, now, I got to tell you, I, I've been, uh, quote, for lack of a better term, a fan and watcher of yours for a long time, okay? And... Uh, you know, I didn't realize it until I looked it up, okay? But you have ridden in an awful lot of races. I don't even know if you know how many, how many. You're just shy of about 35,000 races. That's right. And, and what's amazing, and I've never looked this up on anybody, but what I didn't realize is your in-the-money percentage is about a third which is insane, I think. I mean, you know, you got like 12,000 of, of 34 and, and plus 12,000 race that you're in the money. I mean, that's a, a pretty, pretty solid record overall. Oh, thank you. Um, and, you know, the fact that you're able to compete at this stage of your career in what I consider a, a, a sport that definitely gives younger guys an advantage. I mean, it's a physical sport. I don't think people realize how, how riders are pound for pound, probably the strongest and toughest athletes out there are right up there. Uh, and it's hard not to have an, you know, have an advantage when you're, you know, 23 and competing against guys in their fifties, you know? Yeah. So let me ask you this. How do you do that? How do you compete with these guys that are, you know? Well, I first and foremost say, I, 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 without a doubt, would have to say I'm blessed because I've had some peers, some good friends, some great riders that their uh, body just uh, shut down on them. Uh, it just didn't shut down, but over a period of time, it, it just got to where it was um, not producing the results they were putting the demand on it and I'm very fortunate I get out there and I still ride with these young guys as 20 and I even like to call the 50 year old guys young now it's fun <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun I think the energy I've been very fortunate genetically wise and uh, my philosophical beliefs is along with um, just uh, family support and uh, maintaining the health as I've always considered myself a professional athlete and uh I have to live that lifestyle. It used to be a discipline, whether it be diet and exercise and, and things of that nature. I could go on a long list there, but I would just say now it's a way of life. So I'm comfortable and uh, I, I'm very blessed, as I say, to be riding at this level, at this level, prestigious level of the uh, circuit that I'm in. And I'm glad you brought up prestigious and we'll come back to that because I, I agree with you, but anything that, that, that you do as part of your physical or mental regimen that keeps you fit, like what, 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 what is the lifestyle for you at this point that, that you're, you're, you're right around 60 years old, am I correct? I am 61. Okay. God bless, man. Um, and, and, you know, to compete at that stage at the level you're competing is, 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 is remarkable. What, what, what is it specifically, uh, you know, lifestyle wise, what's, what, what's the regimen like at that age to keep you fit enough 
um, and sharp enough mentally to get out there and make those split second decisions and, you know, be athletic enough to get down and execute what your mind is telling you to do. Wow, that's a, a great question with uh, quite a bit of variables on it. I'll start with the most people like to start off with diet. Again, diet is a discipline decision. And that's the one of the tough ones because you can find yourself um, having enough sustenance to provide what you need, but yet you're still hangry. And right. uh, you just have to keep that in your mind that, you know, I've eaten enough. I, I don't need any more food. And it, that is a discipline. That again is is come to a lifestyle, but um, that's the question and the subject matter that comes up. As far as the sharpness of the skills and the physical, I do have to uh, stay physically active in certain arenas that I, for example, was looking for. I have a, several bicycles. I do things at a different age now that whereas when I was younger, I felt like I was overworking. So stretching is better for me than so to speak, lifting weights or what have you. And I do resistance, but I could go on and on about that. And then as far as the sharpness, I do a variety of things to just test, test my own reflexes and um, check in my uh, coherent and making sure that I'm, I'm thinking the process. As, as you mentioned, when you get out there, you have a, a strategy, A, B, or C, and sometimes you'll have a D strategy that blows your mind. For example, I had a horse that made a late run and I was telling Rosemary, this horse broke a LinkedIn front, went wire to wire. He's never seen the front, maybe except on a morning workout. So things like that, you just have to respond and go by your instincts. And uh, as far as keeping your, um, your mental capacity going, that's probably one of the things that concerns me the most as well as physical. But I know that I have the ability and I'm uh, very grateful as far as the balance and being able to ride horseback and race horseback. So uh, I count that all as something that I've been gifted with. And uh, I want to utilize that gift as long as I'm allowed to. Now, you, you've you ridden some, and, and, and I don't think, you know, people realize this. You've ridden some really, really special horses in, in, in your career. Uh, Wise Dan. There you go. One of them. Uh, one of my personal favorites and one of my personal favorite rides of yours, and it was probably because I bet and won, was, um, I want to say, it, it was a horse you rode for Bobby. For The horse was Leroy Decimo. Yeah, but you awesome. rode him in a grade one, I think, out at Hollywood Park when you were riding in California. I, I want to say the cinema, maybe it was, or something. It was a grade one, grade one stake, and you rode him for Bobby out there, and he won, went wire to wire, and it was just a, like, just a, a yeah, flawless wire to wire ride. Really a gifted horse, and well trained by a gifted individual, a horseman, Bobby Frankel, which I, I love swinging a leg over and riding for him, the late Bobby Frankel. What an honor that was. But uh, you mentioned two horses that were definitely favorites. I like to speak about them. And Wise Dan, there, he was the kind of horse to, you just you stayed out of his way. If he broke to the lead and wanted to gallop, which he rarely ever did, but if he wanted to move at the five eighths pole or at the quarter pole, that's when he made his move. He was an intelligent horse and he had an enormous amount of, of talent. And I feel very fortunate I got to swing a leg over him and uh, win some races. Let, let, let me ask you a question that, 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 you know, someone who never rode, you know, I've, ne I've, I've had one experience on the back of a horse uh, and I made the mistake of telling the, the people that, um, you know, how to ride. And I used to go to the racetrack all the time. And I, I, I was on a date. I was about 17, 18 years old. And I didn't want to look like any. I said, yeah, no problem. I said Western or English. I didn't know there was a difference. I said, doesn't matter. He says, okay, get up on that one. And the first thing thing I knew I was in trouble is because there was no that big thing to hold on to was not there, you know. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, it just went downhill from there, but we'll we'll leave that out. But when 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 you say you're on a horse like Wise Dan or anybody and he wants to go, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that means you're riding, you've got a hold of the horse, and he starts pulling. Is that how a horse tells you they want to go, or is there another way? Uh, no, that's that's pretty accurate. He'll just start pulling you and he would relax around the turn and sometimes down the backside. It could be the five eights. It could be the a half mile pole. I've seen him do that with Johnny Velasquez. Uh, Julian Repru rode him. And then uh, when I rode him um, at uh, Prescott, 
he just waited till we turned for home and he shot up down the stretch and just opened up a mini home. But he just seemed to be the intelligent level of knowing what he was doing out there, knew his job, and he did it well. But boy, he was a big, strong, fast horse. Fun now, I, 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 I want to get into something and I'll, I'll use this to get into it because I think it's interesting and it's also something that probably a lot of people don't know. But you won one of the biggest races in the world, the Japan Cup. Yeah. Um, Doug O'Neill, I think a fleet dance would name it a horse, correct? Yes, the Leathermen's own the horse. Yeah. Right. There's a rumor out there, okay, and I don't know if it's true. You can tell 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 me if it's true that that a rider in that race cursed or said something a little bit nasty to you, and you kind of put it to him and went on and, and and won the race. So if you could take us through that story, if it's true, if it's not true, it's not true. But if it is, I would love to know what he said, what you did, how you responded. And then I want to ask you something else about riding today against, uh, as opposed to riding a couple of years back. But let's start with that. Is the fleet rumor that I've heard true or yeah, not? It's probably a rumor. But what, what, how I will define it and explain that is if you do watch the film, it's not too hard to find on YouTube, the Japan Cup 2003. You'll see him as he gets by me. He puts about a half a head and, and he just looks over at me like, and I could see it. Uh, uh -huh. He looked like I got you put away as he run up to me, well, he didn't know. I still was sitting on a little more horse. I wasn't asking for everything because the track there on the front side had an incline. And I can't remember how many uh, meters it was, but the track was not uniform all the way around. Down the backside, it had, I think, maybe a decline. And then at the stretch, about where our eighth pole would be, there was a incline. So the track changed. It actually had where it went up. And he had caught me on that incline. And I actually was thinking, I've rode up inclines before and horses will use a lot of energy more than they need to. So I was just, I was riding him, but at the same time, I, I knew I had another 200 yards, so to speak, but there are meters over there. And uh, I just couldn't gut the horse. And for whatever reason, that's how I rode him. And as he got by me, my horse re-engaged with him. And then I ended up nailing him at the wire or getting by him right before the wire. It was a tight finish, but he come by me like he was just going to blow by me. And I, I just can remember him looking over and people asked me, did he say anything? And he might have It spent some time, but again, he's uh, the Japanese, the Japan right. there. And uh, I didn't really understand the language, even though I had studied it for a while. And, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell if he said anything or not, but uh, that's probably where that rumor, because people see him kind of bob his head at me. And they said, what did right. he say to you? What did he say to you? And I was like, I, I don't remember what he said, but I could tell you what the look on his face was, like he had me beat. And right. at the time, I thought, yeah, well, he's going on by me, but he didn't accelerate past me. He was right there. And I was like, well, I'm not done yet. Right. I mean, I'm not saying anything. In fact, one of the things that were uh, uh, pretty impressive is they the way they run things over there in Japan. I really like the way they run the racing. It's it's definitely strict, but they they were adamant about telling all riders there's no talking and communicating out there on the racetrack, which we do all the time here to some degree. Some of it's not appropriate to uh, repeat. But uh, while I was over there, you you got to be careful because not only do they have excellent video, but they have they did say they have audio that goes around the track, and they would get on some of the riders because. Some of the foreigners would come in and, uh, you know, they were just having fun there and clowning around. And with me, I was kind of nervous. This was a big race and uh, there was a lot of pressure. And then the, the monsoon came in. So that was something even to not take lightly. But uh, overall, we had a lot of fun out there and they do have some stringent rules in Japan, which I respected. Uh, but to clear up the actual rumor that uh nothing was said that i understood and i don't think that i was cussed by any means that i know i might have been <laughs> after the fact they were like oh you know they were saying certain things to try to intimidate me like you weren't supposed to beat that's the favorite and the lead rider right. of japan and you know the japan mafia owned this horse and i was like right. i don't know if i'm gonna get out of here with my neck but yeah <laughs> I just had fun with it it was a, a lifetime experience of but I was plum wore out by the time I got back to the States. With, uh, yeah, that's a, that's that, that's, that's a rough. To, to win a 50 to one shot. So. Right, right. Now, that 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 was a remarkable moment in racing. I think it was nice to see an, an, an American horse go there and win a, a race like that with a rider like like yourself. Okay. Um, 
And you know, you mentioned how strict they are over there. I'm I'm a fan of of their racing and the way they they, they do things. And I actually think, well, I I personally wish that our jurisdictions. I mean, if we had a central one, that that would be nice. We don't, but I I would love it if we ran things a little bit more like they do, because I, I I think in general as a sport, we've failed to police ourselves and instill the confidence in, 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 in the public that I think the sport needs to thrive. I mean, perception is a lot. I think a lot of the criticism we get is not accurate and, and not appropriate, but I think plenty of it is. Uh, so a few more. I, I would have to agree. A lot of people ask, well, where do we start? Well, it's not so much as where we start. It's a matter of just getting started. I think at one or two times, there may have been an effort to start something in that direction to where we would have be under one umbrella and more uniform instead of all these different jurisdictions making uh, inconsistent decisions and so much of the racing that continues to as you mentioned policing ourselves and therefore we literally shoot ourselves in the foot so to speak or give ourselves another black eye i agree i i, I agree we're on, we're on the same page and it, and it, it is frustrating because I don't, I see us so dysfunctional where we, we can't even fix what, uh, lack of a better term, John, low hanging fruit. Like you'll notice uh, on, well, you don't see it because you're out there on the racetrack, but on, on a Saturday, you've got two stakes going off and, you know, one track is holding everybody behind the gate, waiting for the post time of the other stake, just so they got to run them at the same time. I mean, we can't even stagger the post time of stake races on a Saturday and let people watch them both comfortably. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, if we can't get that right, how are we going to get big things right? You know, it's just, it, it, it's very, very discouraging as a, as a fan, as a better. Um, it just, you, you know, it's, it, it, it's frustrating. I would love to hear your take on something that, that fans and betters gripe about a lot. Um, I've been watching races a long time, and I think I can pretty much tell the difference and the fine line between race riding and going a little bit beyond and just being a little careless, reckless and going, you, you, you know, crossing that line to hurting or, or, or fouling or doing something that you may get away with, but you really shouldn't be doing. Um, over the years, and you've got probably as much experience as anybody, is it worse or different today as far as riders crossing that line and getting away with it because of of maybe inconsistent stewards or, or, or the lack of uh, uh, them wanting to disqualify horses sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes I see things that are so inconsistent, like today, what you can get away with um, a week from now, you might get disqualified for. I mean, it just, you know, it seems frustrating. How, how, how has it changed and what is it like from, from a jock's perspective? Well, I'd like to say it has changed, but just as you said, um, you're seeing it, uh, the fans are seeing it, and I see it as well. I'll be at the same track where they take a horse down or they make a decision, and uh, two weeks later, something very similar or, or as equal, or maybe worse, and it's uh, swept under the rug, so to speak. But uh, there are some things out there that are race riding. I had a the top rider here, he, he had boxed me in and I could have just banged him out and, and made, uh, but I would have been on the movie list. I might've got disqualified. So I had to just eat my horse and the trainer and everybody, I don't know if the public could see that, but it's just, that was some race riding. And then the following week I came out and I won by five. Um, but those kind of, uh, you have to respect those kind of performances. But then uh, there are some that are just blatantly I would say reckless, careless, and flat out dangerous. So they need to realize that when they're out there, not only are they riding amongst their peers and we're under the scrutiny of the sharp eye of the videos that they have today and, and how they can really uh, dissect them, uh, but the fact that you're also riding someone's horse that's spent a lot of money, a lot of time, and there's people employed all around this horse. So take that in consideration. It's just not your uh, uh, op ample opportunity to uh, treat people or the equine athlete as, as you please to do. Just like I could have banged my way out. And there's many times I have. 
Uh, but I knew that particular time, and, and believe me, I, I brought that race home with me. And right. I, I just, I, I can't bang him. Besides that day, they had already had a, two disqualifications, and the movie list, of, uh, the jocks had to go in the review. And I'm in the race thinking about that, man, do I want to get on the list and go in there? And those stewards are going to be angry enough that I could find myself with a suspension and bang these horses, speed cut. That just instantly went through my mind within a fraction. And I was like, I, I professionally, I know I got to take care of this horse. I can't be slamming this guy to get out. So hopefully it'll open. It'll open. It, it opened, but not enough time. He got to jump on me. He, he beat me. He, he went on to win by about three or four. And I come chasing at him. The same thing, uh, perfect example is when I went to Arkansas Derby, I think in 2011, where uh, Corey Nakatani dropped to the inside. And I knew right then and there, yeah, he's saving ground, smart to do. And we're adamant in America about saving ground. Right. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all run the shortest way around. I got another conversation I can get into about G forces and in sufficient, efficient energy. But he, I had moved up to his spot. And then I just hesitated till we straight for home and then I punched away. And that derby, you see, I went on Arch 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 Arkansas Derby. Right. That, and he come running on Neo uh, for Ask Music. And that horse should have won the Arkansas Derby that year. But and that's what happened to me just last week. And those things happen in race riding. And that's race riding. But right. outside of that, where guys are slamming or just forcing horses one way or another, uh, that's um a little reckless in my opinion and then there's also just blatant mistakes made out there that is not necessarily intentional but we all get that adrenaline that pressure and the intensity to compete and ride and win i mean it, it's just you stay hungry and that's another thing i'm probably I, I just stay hungry and as you can probably tell my energy level goes up just talking about it but well uh, you could see that you you could see the passion but i could see that when you ride you know, I could see, I, you, you know, you could see that when you ride and to compete, I think at the level you're competing at at this stage, yeah. you need that. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring something up because it, it, it bothered me for you, okay, um, when it happened. And I saw it when it happened, watching the race live, and I said, wow, this guy should have won the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I know exactly. Uh, and, and, and I, I saw it when it happened. And like I said, someone who's followed your career and, and, and knows that you're certainly a talented enough rider to have won a few of them, you know, but the Derby is that elusive thing that you don't only have to be good. You've got to be lucky. You don't necessarily even have to have the best horse. You just got to be in the right spot at the right time and everything's got to click. Exactly. And it was clicking for you. It was clicking, and, and I saw it get snatched away. And there was so much going on in that race that everybody was talking about a million different things, and nobody was talking about that, you know? But I saw it, and I was like, wow, John Court should have won this race. Um, let, me, let, me, let me take me through that, man. I know it's hard. It's gut-wrenching, man, but you're sitting on the turn on will take charge, okay? Going into the far turn. What's in your mind? You tell me. I love the way the race set up and he, the way he was breathing and moving underneath me. And I knew Orb was going to be coming around and he would have to pull the trigger early and he was going to be coming around me. Sure enough, he showed up as we were straight for home and I was sitting with a full and we'll take charge. That's a quarter mile stretch. So he's always good for a solid that last three sixteenths, an eighth of a mile. He's got a punch that you just can't get by. And when I run up to him, I saw Orb run up to me and he was just engaged and I was ready to sit down and actually draw away from Orb. And he went on to win the Derby, but Johnny Velasquez pulled his hand, whip out with his left hand like that. And he didn't even touch his horse and the horse swooped right in front of me. And I thought I was going to fall. Here I am in the Derby and going to fall. He just, and I immediately corrected my horse to get to the inside. At the same time, Johnny corrected to get his horse. And so I followed him back over and I was like, I'm done. I've just cooked myself, rode the worst race of my life. I, nothing I could have really done, but I was glad I didn't fall. But yeah, you're right. Uh, that was uh, probably one of those that will go to the grave thinking, man, I, it was right there in my grasp. It'd be like a ball player catching the, the winning and the balls in his hands and out it goes. And it was, 
you know, fourth and down or something. I, I don't know how you want to relate it, but it could be, you can relate any kind of sports, but yeah, that's, that's the race that, uh, that still sits. And Johnny Velasquez was extremely apologetic afterwards. And, um, and I don't know. That, I don't know how you apologize for that. Uh, he came back. He says, John, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. My horse ducked. And I was just still mummified of like, wow, I, damn the luck. You talk about something that, um, it just makes you feel like you're a snake bit. Everything went perfect. And then right at there, it was just snatched away from me. But I was happy for Joel Rosario and or uh, Joel is a really good friend of mine, a great rider, and he's proving it to this day. And uh, I, I, I try to embrace the positivity about it and not dwell on the negativity because that negativity, it, it, it'll get negativity will give you ulcers, keep you awake at night and just ultimately uh, beat you down and affect you in many other areas of life. So you have to, uh, I like to coin the term, uh, turn the page. You just have to be able to turn the page. Well, in horse racing, you, you, you certainly do, but that, that, that was, that was a, a, a gut punch for sure. Um, and I felt for you, I felt for you. I did, man. I, I saw it when it happened and I was like, wow. Uh, and I, 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 I felt for you because I thought, you know, I, I thought he was going to win, you know, and hearing you say I, it. I knew, I knew he was going to win, but. Yeah, that, 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 that was one that uh, just wasn't meant. You, you, you know, racing is, 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 is so much that kind of a game. People don't realize that you could do everything right uh, and just something could, you know, it's those intangibles that, that will get you, you know. Absolutely right about that. You can do everything right. Then you come back scratching your head and you have to just say, well, that's horse racing. That's why it's been going on for eons, it seems to me. Yeah, no, it is. Now, you said something before when we, when we, we touched base on saving ground and how important that is and how much focus we put on that here in the States. Uh, and you mentioned something about G-force or something. Yeah, well, just in the turn, the horses have to fight the G-force. And there, there's just, there's sometimes... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about saving ground and a believer, but there are sometimes that horses struggle being down on the inside. And for me, it's not so much as those factors, that's two factors, but uh, you have the G forces want, they have to use more energy to make the turn than they would use on a, the stretch run. And then there's the, the, uh, the ultimate issue of you usually have three, at least three to two to three riders on a minimum that want the rail and they're going to the rail regardless who they're riding. And, and I often strategize thinking, I don't want to get behind this horse. Just the other day, I was like, all right, I'm in a full field and we're going down the backside and we're hitting a three H pole and we're just boxed in there tight. And I, was, oh, I'm behind the guy, the jock is in front of me that I did not want to be behind. They all of a sudden dropped in down the backside and they were shipping their horse the whole way. Sure enough, they come up empty and now they're in front of me and I'm thinking, how am I going to ever get around? How am I going to get around? I, ha I had to sit there and wait and the other horses going on by me and hopefully there's nothing behind them to where I can wheel out and get around this stopping horse, but things of that nature. And I put the emphasis of there's always two or three riders that no matter what, and it's drilled in their head to save ground. But you have to take that in consideration that uh, you have to be careful of not only the stock you're riding, but certain rider changes and the strategy and, and you know the influence that the rider will have put upon him how to ride a certain race. And I, I give you example as I had a couple of horses I was near and I could tell, I don't care what you do, but you get this horse to the front. And the, the, the guy has hardly any speed. He's got tactical speed, but their speed in the race, legitimate. But they will gut their horse to follow those instructions. And uh, then it just becomes um, like bumper pull. You've got to not get banged around, but get around those horses that those riders have already used up. And they're going to come back to you. Um, so it's, it's better for me regardless of the instructions I get with that being said to, to allow a horse to run to his natural style. It might've been a speed horse two years ago, but now he's setting off the pace or coming. And if that's the way he's running to the charts, his best performance, try to allow that to out come in your strategy 
even though you have other horses in there, you got to consider that maybe you're the only speed. He doesn't, then you walk the dog. That's the beauty right. of that, which is called you set a slower pace if you inherit the lead. And, uh, but as far as the, uh, the way that all, most the tracks are built in America, there's a little happy place, and I call it between the two and the three path, that a horse is really get comfortable. Not necessarily on the fence, but on some racetracks, right on top of the fence, not all the way around, there's certain places to go. And then you got to consider the surface. Like this Oakland, we had some bad weather come in. You'll notice everybody was staying off the fence. You could win on the fence, but you better have at least five to eight links best horse. Wow. Because you can feel the horse's labor. You can, you, they, they'll clip it along really nice, smooth. You drop in safe ground and, and then you could just feel that little bit of a cuffiness or, or laborsome. So you get out there in that little happy spot and then they, they just less effort and they just seem like they're getting a hold of the track. And that's a wonderful feeling when you got one breathing and he's getting a hold of the track and he understands what's going on. And if a horse runs like that, you, you beat favorites, you pay big numbers, and people are like, how did that happen? Well, the horse had the best trip, and maybe the favorite was, um, you know, he's favorite because of the handicapping, the way they're betting on him, the way he's been performing. And then he comes into this race, maybe didn't get up, so to speak, on the right side of the stall. Right. There's all and you, you can feel that. as So as a rider, you're telling me you're, you're, you're riding in a race and you're riding on a car. You can feel and know where the best parts of the track are and can tell how your horse is handling different parts of the racetrack. Yes, generally. Yes, I would say generally. Not, not all the time. Some of these horses I've never swung a leg over before and I ride a great race on them. Some of them that, to me, they look good. They're training good and they run a, a fluke race. I know a horse the other day, a double call of mine. We rode the winner and the double call should have been right there and come to find out it, it had got some shoes on that morning and they equipped the horse um, for whatever reason. That means they just trimmed the feet, put the new shoes on. It was a little too tight. So the, they, they're like, what the heck? Uh, this horse has been training good. They went back. Sure enough, they test the feet and the horse is, you know, like, I, I, they don't say I, I, they just, right. they respond like their feet are tender. So little things like that. And I was like, wow, I almost rode that filly over this one. Cause they were like, but she ended up um, having tender feet just because of the new shoes they put on. So it just things like that come in that public don't know, even the trainer, nobody knows till after the race is over. Right. Right. It's, 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 it's so many, so many factors and, 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 and elements to this game that affect a, a, a race's outcome. Uh, you, how you, let me, I, I mean, this has got to happen to you. I mean, with your experience and expertise level being what it is, how do you politically correct handle a situation when a younger or, or, or less experienced trainer comes into the paddock and tells you what to do and you know, he's dead wrong and he's giving you instructions and you just know he's wrong. Do you tell him, do you follow him anyway? Do you, yeah, I and mean, does it is it a case by case basis depending who it is? It's a case by case, and some situations you'll be uh, approach it with a gingerly approach, uh, carefully. Outside of that, you'll just listen to them. And uh, to be honest with you, the best approach is well, if it unfolds that way, we'll try to make it happen. But if not, we got to do what it takes to win the race, and you just keep that to yourself. And if right. you win the race, all is forgiven. I've won races for the Hall of Famer. Uh, Wayne Lucas says, this horse got to be on the front. There's no speed in the race. And I thought, well, uh, to me, there's some speed in the race. And we got some other riders that have come in and they are speed riders. Uh, they're not local riders here. So I know they're going to be pushing what speed there is. But yeah, absolutely. If I can break on the lead with them, I'm going to sit comfortable because that's the way this horse runs. Well, they went down there 21 flat, 44, and I'm sitting behind them. And I asked my horse to run there, and I was like, okay, now this didn't work out. Sure enough, everybody turns from home, they, they're exhausted, and everybody's riding down the stretch. And I was just sitting behind the speed. There's nothing I could do. They started coming back to me, and then I just kind of picked him up and encouraged him. He picked the bridle up, and he just opened up like a fresh horse down the lane. It was just totally the opposite. And uh, Wayne was like, man, that didn't turn out the way I thought it would. And I was like, I didn't think it would turn out the way that way either. But he said, I was sure glad you don't listen to my instructions. So things <laughs> like that are humorous and, and pleasure. And of course, they've sometimes gone the other way. Anyone who's been around racing, they see uh, sometimes uh, 
if the strategy or the outcome wasn't the way they expected that uh, uh, emotions and uh, expressions will fly. But uh, we all, you can't be in this game without feeling something down inside your soul. They call it gets into your blood or your genes that um, it's going to affect you. And, and, and you love it one day and you can't imagine doing anything other difference. And then other days you, I might not even be, Pulled up, say, oh, I need to quit and go get a real job. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do want to disclose something for you. And this is going to probably sound, I have a lot of people that um, they ask me, why are you riding this horse? Well, you'll see me ride some horses that absolutely look like they've got no shot and all that. What, who, your agent, I cannot believe. What you don't understand is I've got clients that have been with me for 42 years. And right. then I've got someone that today, I mean, last week that came by and they're like, I got this one horse. And I know you always got one horse you raised in your backyard and a nice yard, right. have, by the way. But yeah, I'll ride your horse. But let me at least work it so I know what to expect. So that happens a lot. And uh, I tell my agent, look, if so-and-so comes in town, this trainer or this owner, I, I will ride their horse. And, uh, I'll do that occasionally. I try to give them the best shot. And what they like about it, they, you mentioned the money percentages. I try to get them a check. I like to upset them and even get into the, the back pay where it's fit, right. how far back. If I can get that best check, I, uh, I, it rewards me. Uh, not financially necessarily, but it rewards me something that has more tangible value that I can appreciate about the game. Because I know I, I've been involved in, in this game long enough to know what people put their heart and soul into their raising these equine athletes. So um, I, I do that a lot. I, not as much as I used to, but even though I have that high percentage of money, it kind of surprised me because I would ride a lot of horses that um, it just surprises people. Just like when I went to Japan, they call me and ask about Japan. As soon as they asked me, I said, when are we going? They loved it to this day. He just, he didn't ask about the horse, what the race was, what kind of, what, what odds I'll have. These guys always ask these questions. And uh, my, they said they were, all they did was present it and wanted to get in the conversation. And my response was, yeah, name me on. I'll, I'll say a little funny, a funny, well, I, I think it's funny story uh, 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 about you um, that I always, I always remembered, you know, um, I used to go, when I first moved to Florida to call the all the time, okay? And I moved to Florida in 1990. So it was already like this simulcasting era, you know? And now that we have so much betting and watching from home and the track is less crowded, Oakland's a little different. It's more like a, I always call it like the Southern version of, of Saratoga. It's kind of like a holiday meet. I spent a couple of years in Hot Springs um, and I used to go to go to Oakland every day. And I noticed like on Friday after, it's different than any other part of the country where the racing sometimes has that like, you know, gambling stigma, like, oh, Oakland in, in, in Arkansas, when I was there, Hot Springs and even Little Rock, everything was closed on Friday afternoon. You'd be out of the office to go to the racetrack on Friday afternoon. It was like, okay, you know, it was like acceptable. It's like almost expected, you know? And I love that obviously being a racing fan, but um Back at, at, at this time at Calder, I used to go to Calder every day. I had moved to Florida and simulcasting was in full string, swing. And like I said, I had always watched your career and I had always been successful betting on horses you rode and always thought this guy will get you home if he's got the horse, you know? And there was a guy that used to be a fan of yours, okay? I didn't know who he was, but he was one of those loud rooters, okay? And he would roll up his program like a whip and he would hit himself with the thing and he would always scream. And I always knew, even if I wasn't watching Churchill Downs, because it, it was during the Churchill meets and you were riding in Kentucky, I would always know when you won a race. And so would everybody in that section. Because every time you won a race, he would be screaming. He was a big John Court player. He would scream, 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 Rufio. And when you know how we knew you won? Because he would go, Court is in session every time you want to race. And so everybody knew, we all used to just laugh, oh, he won on John Court again. And it was just, it was like a funny thing that everybody in that section I called and used to laugh at and, 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 and observe. So, and this is, like I said, it was probably in the nineties. So you've been booting him in for, for a long time. Uh, and I really wish that things would have worked out different in, 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 in that off race, but it ain't over yet because- yeah. You still ride for the Hortons. 
and Dallas Stewart. And Dallas pops up with horses. I mean, Ben Diesel mm -hmm. is a nice horse. I mean, I mean, he, he, he had kind of a strange trip last time on the inside. Yeah. I couldn't tell. I, I liked his chances last time out because I loved that he had broke on the far outside last time and was now moving in. And I said, wow, that's got to be a tremendous tactical advantage. He lost all that ground last time. He had to go up on the outside. I said, I, I, I like his chances in there, you know. Uh, and I thought he ran a strange race. And, and, and as, as an observer, again, I can't feel or know what you know. But just as a race watcher, it looked to me like, you know, he might not have been as comfortable on the inside with those horses outside of him, only having four or five races, whatever it is, as he might have been if he was outside those other horses when he tried tried to make that rally. I don't know. But I still think he's got the potential to get himself into the Derby field, probably for sure, point-wise, if he hits the board or wins another one of these, these races. And I think he's by Will Take Charge, too. So maybe that would be a really interesting story if, if, a, if a son of Will Takes Charge takes you back to the Derby at this point, you might be the oldest guy to ride in the Derby and win a great at stakes if you aren't already. I don't know the stats on that, but you may already be that guy. Yeah, I hope to break my own record. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's an upcoming three-year-old. We have a lot of hope for him on the Derby trail. And he's been learning. Things have been a little bit tough for him to take it in, but he's really seemed to have turned over a new leaf and, and starting to put it together, what his job or what he's doing out there. And I was able to see that, but he still spots things and every now and then respond to uh, something that shows that he's still a juvenile individual, but he's putting it together. He, where they set that gate up last time I was making a big run and all of a sudden it was like something caught his attention and I couldn't, I don't know if it's because he's making the lead or what it was. So I got after him and then it occurred to me immediately. He saw these gate crew where they, we broke from the gate they just pulled the gate to the infield. And they're all standing there. They're not on the rail, but they're just about five, eight foot away. But they're all wearing their coats and they got a bench there and they're sitting there standing up watching the race. Well, I want, I'm not, not the first time that's happened to me or any other rider. I've seen that spot when they cross the 16th pole, right before they cross the 16th pole. Sometimes you can even see where they had raked up the tracks, but horses sometimes will have some kind of a falter there. Some horses run through it and everybody loves it when they do that. But if you have a horse that uh, spots the, the track where they raked it or sees the crowd, all of a sudden there's this group of people and they're all wearing Oakland jackets because they work for the, the gate starter, assistant starters that are right behind the pole. And there that's, that's the gate. And I've seen as I'm over it, uh, discussing the fact that he spotted that, he moved away, I, I, I corrected him. Got into him right-handed, but it was just enough, if nothing else, to cost me second place money. I don't know if I was going to beat Johnny Velasquez went on Baffert's horse, but um, I would have sure loved to have uh, not that as an excuse. That those those things happen. Sometimes horses see things that um, the human eye, much less the mind, can ever really conceive of what actually happened out there. You know, Oakland used to still have the wire strung across the track and I also was one of those that told the stewards and the racing bodies that they need to remove that wire it's, it's it sits the same height as a ceiling and believe right. it or not even though it's just a wire and that's how they used to measure um the winning the winning the win on photos whatever they had an actual wire stretched across there they finally removed that because there were horses that would see that wire and they would literally duck their head or or pawn wow. his head one way or the other. And they were like, what was they doing right at the wire? What happened? Did you take, I heard it over and I, I, it occurred to me from an older rider one time says they're ducking the wire. And I was like, ducking the wire. What's, what's that? No, they're literally a wire. Wow. It's higher than a, your ceiling at your house and horses spot things that humans normally don't see. And they yeah. would do such a thing. Um, a horse can train on a track every day. They put some new plants by a, a, a pole over there by the five H to ha hide some of the electrical work that they had that had been there forever. And those horses spot those those bushes there. They've never been there before. And you know they're they'll they'll duck from it or something. And wow, that's interesting. Uh, it, the human didn't even realize they changed uh, the right. bushes. But um, one of the things they did here at Oakland, they there's a drain over there and they put uh, some um, 
straw bales around it to not erode so the ground wouldn't erode since they've reconstructed it. and there's horses they don't look at that straw and they're like what the heck is that it looks like in their mind you never know a horse is a side animal as well and he might have thought it was something that hadn't been there before so they'll take a step or two and uh in another direction so i'm just bringing that up as different things that happen in races that it's hard for us to explain and when we do explain it um they don't people don't believe it just i'll give you an example i was in a state, i was in the stake of belmont one day we're going down the back side and i'm like i don't know third or fourth choice who do i got inside of me and how cordero and we're okay. right on and he just literally leans right over and screams bloody murder my horse pitched its head and I had right. to explain to George Austin, what the heck happened over there? And I go, you won't believe it if I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> of all people, the one who has is known for his antics, uh, Cordero, and I run third in that race. He probably cost me the win. But I was a young rider way back in the 80s, come up in Belmont, and Randy Romero was up there. It was a great time, and, and the horse was just a natural runner. And, uh, and uh, that's when I first learned, you know, about it. Angel or Angel Cordero that uh, he he was the master of his trade. I mean, he yeah, was, he and he used to uh, like to mess. I see. I grew up in New York around him, and, and, yeah. around, and he, he, used like like, he used to like to mess with people that come in from out of town, big time. Man. Yeah, that was me. yeah, that was his home turf, and yeah, he, you he know, good. Yeah, he got me yeah. good. It was good though. It was yeah, no, he uh, he now he could race ride. He could oh, race. Ride. He knew how to do it. Yeah. yeah with a, a fine artistic um polished way of executing yeah i, I, I want to ask you something that may, maybe you could help help me to understand this it's it's one of those things like like you said you can't understand about races you rode one of my favorite mares of, of all time and she had a specialty to her okay she was deadly down the hill at san Renita. can't be a corsa was her name okay and she was five maybe eight lengths better down the hill than she was anywhere else even sprinting on a turf on a radio down the hill that was her thing you know um what makes a horse have an affinity for a particular racetrack or a particular distance or a particular uh thing like 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 slop you, you know the horse is so much better in the slop and and I, you know, I'll tell you, it gets even deeper than that. And I, I can't figure it out, but I know it exists. Saratoga is one of my favorite meets. And I've noticed that sires that loved Saratoga yeah. or mares that love produce horses that love Saratoga. And Saratoga is one of those weird tracks. You could watch Saratoga for years, okay? And horses that excel there maybe are okay for the rest of the year to come back there next year and excel. And those kind of horses produce horses that have that same nuance. Yeah. And I'm like, how can that be? There has to be some science to that or some genetic thing or something that makes it, it. It's not coincidence. Coincidence is for romance novels. So there's got to be some. How do you explain that with a can be a course or, or something like uh, some, some yeah. nuance that, like that? that? That particular course is that she owned it. She liked it. She she run with confidence. If anything, you just wanted to keep her set up because she would, she would just fly down that track. She could go 43 for the half and just continue that and then kick away down the stretch. But she would, she was a little high strung. Um, I, I can recall her very well. And uh, she just, um, to the turf, especially the downhill, I had an agent take off her one. Why did you take off of it? The Leatherman's owner. That's, <laughs> she's almost undefeated. Why? And he go, well, this filly, she's coming out of stakes. And she's got better numbers. I said, not on this course. I don't care. And sure enough, I think I run like fourth or fifth. And Mark Gidry was out there and he was having a bum day. And I don't know about this. And well, look at your, your filly on that. And I said, dude, you're going to win this race. I said, believe me. My feeling, she can run her eyeballs out. And no one's going to catch Cameron. Of course, right now she's she's hitting on all pistons, so to speak. She's she's in her prime. She loves the course. You just have to sit still on her. And uh, I um, remember talking to Aaron Greider about her as well. But uh, she was definitely special. And you mentioned that sometimes it's genetics, sometimes it's the course. And a lot of people like to follow. And I'm a big advocate of the broodmare side. But there are some sires. When I win my first Arkansas Derby, it was a line of David. 
they were right. they were gonna ride and i said I, I wrote him some lion parts if he's anything what i saw like his daddy he'll be double tough i, I just don't see him getting beat and you know you wow okay well we are looking for a rider let's and sure enough he went like that but I just wrote him like I remember his daddy, Lionheart. So sometimes you got to follow where the gift follows the lineage line. I remember that line of David Ray. I was there that day and bet on that horse. He was a big price. He was like 20 or something to one or something, if I remember correctly. I, I, that, that's when I was in Arkansas at that time. Super uh, back to win the Kentucky Derby. He got by me, but I that was like, I knew my horse probably wasn't fit enough. And I was like, oh, I was all out. He didn't do it fair too well. I didn't get to ride him in the Kentucky Derby, but and sometimes it's surface. Uh, I remember riding our Philly well bred. I, I rode her all at different tracks, but whenever it was, she was back at Churchill. Uh, she just loved the surface, and sure enough, her 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 form was not impressive at all, much less halfway decent. But I just had this gut feeling every time this mare gets over here at Churchill, she just her wow attitude. She loves Churchill. I don't know if it's a spiritual nostalgia, but sure enough, and she wasn't the most soundest thing, but I wrote her there. She went, paid big numbers. I was like, why didn't we bet? I mean, I'm not a better, but that's the time. And I told them, the trainer and the owner, this Philly loves you. Ah, well, we just want to get her ready. We're sending her to the brood. We're going to send her to the breeding shed. But sure enough, she went, and they're like, oh, we're going to call it right there. That was impressive. She, I think she might have come back, and she was getting a little bit to the point where she needed to maybe go, but she loved Churchill. So it was just the surface with her. Now, I, I, I know at, at the age you're at, you gotta be thinking that, you know, chances are, are you, you, you know, to get that big one, man, you, you, you know, that, that Derby or Breeders' Cup, those, those I gotta imagine are the two that are, are keeping you going at this point. Yeah, if you're in the oh, dance, you always got a chance. So. That's that's that that's that's for sure. Um, how long do you think you can go? Ah, How many more question. rounds, man? I, I weigh that question uh, daily, weekly, and prayerfully. Um, we'll see. Uh, that's a good question. I don't want to continue to make some astronomical record of being the oldest rider still riding, but. I want to ride to where I'm really enjoying it as I am now to the point where I said, okay, now it's time to step back. You know, there's uh, a tidal wave of new riders, new horsemen coming in and I don't need to be greedy and, and still try to pick and choose, but this is all I've ever done. So I'm just, uh, as I said, prayerfully waiting for that day to where, I, okay, now I know it's a time and I hope and pray that it wouldn't be an injury because the ground's not getting any softer, but, yeah, no, that's, good, that's, good. but that's, that's the part that, nobody likes whether it be the human uh, uh or they uh the equine issue of uh, breaking down and so we want to make sure we can stay healthy and decide that that day is done gracefully would you ever think about training it'd be ashamed all the knowledge and horsemanship that you have to when you stop riding to just pack that in and, and yeah instead that's something of we uh we just sharing it, you know? yeah yeah, and I experiment a little bit where I have the opportunity to make decisions. It would be training decisions, but uh, the game has changed so much and you have to be able to adapt to the changes and embrace them. If not, you get left behind and, and then you find yourself in some type of opposition of like, well, this is just like the flak jackets. I'm not wearing a flak jacket. Now I wouldn't ride without a flak jacket. I never right. like that. But I remember the protests with the flak jackets came out. And if it's not one thing, the helmets, oh, the helmets are better. One thing I'm not a big candidate of is me, people making decisions that are in position, not being able to make the decisions. And, and uh, I, I agree that there is some uh, abuse, perhaps with the whip, but I will be on record. But I'm not in any means in agreement that... Um, they should start counting how many times. I mean, granted, you don't need to be beaten on a horse. But say, for example, you can only hit a horse six times in this way or that way. Well, you're, uh, you're really just kind of assigning somebody some kind of duty that um, they will be taken out of the element of where their talents and skills and their judgment on feeling how a horse responds. I, wrote, I watched the leading rider since his whip rule. He rode a phenomenal race. The betters would have loved it. 
did love it, but it wasn't just six times now. He hit the horse 12 times and the horse was responding. He switched and he wasn't beating him up. He did it in rhythm. It was one of the most beautiful rides. And he went up there in the double digits uh, using his whip. And these whips are so equine friendly. They're not the things that we had years ago that uh, now I am basically trying to stand up to say where you can hit only six times or not use the whip. These people don't understand really what the animal thinks and there's no rationing. And I hear people, oh, those poor horses. Well, I'll tell you, there's not a horse in the world that looks at any human and go, oh, that poor human, he's homeless. Animals don't think like that. So you have to understand, I've, I've been I'm born, raised around these things. I've lived with them. They don't function the way the person who sits at home and like, oh, my daughter was upset and because we took to the races and they were whipping on the horse. So I'm in a position, let's take the whips away. And that's actually happened in this game. Somebody, a prominent individual decided because his little six-year-old daughter was all upset, he's going to make a decision to uh, create a campaign to take whips away. And to me, that's just a, a foolish decision. You're, you're wrecking a, a sport that without a doubt has the heritage before baseball here in the States and, and humanity that uh, you're dabbling in something. Let's focus. We got bigger fish to fry. I, I agree. You know, or my, my take on a, on, a, on a whip rule was, was, was a little bit. There's policing and then there's, as you see in society, ridiculous. Uh, yeah, no, it, it is. And let, let me tell you, I, I actually did it. I actually did a video on the whip rule when, it, when, when they instituted it, I think in California, New Jersey. And, and here was my take. And you tell me if I'm wrong. I didn't think we need to change the whip rule because as far as I understand, the stewards have always had the discretionary power to call any rider in that they felt was abusing the whip right. without changing the rule. So if you say, hey, we got to change the rule because there's a few people that are abusing the horse and public perception is bad. Well, first off, educate the public and let them know that the whips are, like you said, equine friendly and stewards do your job. If you see a guy abusing a horse or going excessive with the stick or using it in a way that's not to try and win the race or anything at all like that. Call him on the carpet, find him, suspend him, and do your job. You don't need a rule that limits a guy to counting six strikes when he's in the heat of passion trying to win a, win a race. Or if it's a safety issue where he's got to tap the horse to keep him from lugging in or lugging out or do something like that. Why should a rider have to be even thinking about that when he's going 40 miles an hour on a racehorse? Doesn't make sense to me. Do your job. If a guy's abusing the stick, call him in and do your job. You don't need a rule for that. You already have a rule for that. Right. You're, we're on the same page. You know, I, 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 you know, again, it's, we're a dysfunctional industry when it comes to, when it comes to no, these kinds of things, you know, good word for it. Dysfunctional. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it really is. It's, it's, it, it's discouraging. I've taken too much of your time. I got one or two quick things to, to, to ask you kind of cliche things, but so many great horses over the years, 60 years old, 61, if you had to put your finger on one or two of your favorites, the best ones, the, the, the real class ones you've been on, who are you going to throw at me? Well, the real ones I've, I've been on? Yeah, the best one, one or two. Well, it was right there with Wise Dan, Lee Walsh, the animal. Uh, even though Arch 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 didn't make it really famous as these two horses, and he was always, I galloped him all the time. So right. he just let me get out. I would show up in the morning, kid, what's he doing today? You want to gallop him? Absolutely. So there's sometimes he might not have had the uh, statistical impressive st stats as Wise Dan or Lee Walsh the Animal, but he was fun to ride. So I would go on with those three horses that were. And I, I, I'm going to ask about one that didn't make it, but looked real good early that you rode. Um, and I don't know if she got hurt or didn't pan out what happens. My memory is not the best anymore. Miss Sethens. I remember her yeah. thinking, wow, she might be a real special, special filly. And she won her first two or three. I don't remember. And then I don't remember what happened to her. But I remember thinking she could be a special horse that you were riding. She, she went on to win some oaks around the country and Prairie Meadows. Uh, yeah, um, that was great. The, the Biggs owned her and uh, Karen and Mr. Biggs um, and Steve, you know, bless his heart. He, he passed away, but he... Um, his name is losing me right now. I can see him like he's sitting here beside me, but 
anyways, yeah, Miss Seffin, she uh she definitely was a heart stealer. Everything about her I really loved. And uh she was uh I, I believe as well as you that she was without a doubt one of them that uh springboard me uh towards the direction I want to go with uh, the bigger, better races at the level I was riding, at the circuits I was riding in. But she hangs in my bedroom as we speak. She? Yeah, okay. I have a picture of her hanging in my bedroom. So all right. Yeah, and she actually threw a Breeder Cup winner uh, as a broodmare, so that's nice. And uh, But I wrote a lot of, we were speaking about we'll take charge. He was a lot of fun, but with Coach, you know, he doesn't ever keep necessarily the same rider, regardless of the races you win. But uh, that, he was he was a lot of fun to ride to. And I, I can just, a, a lot of them that uh, kind of go through my mind, that were a lot of fun to ride. You wish their career would have last longer, but they're uh, they're all limited on a certain amount of time absolutely absolutely well you, you to date have not been limited on time so god bless you man you've you you you're really re really a remarkable athlete for what you've accomplished i mean to be riding at 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 this level at this stage of the game is really a remarkable thing and 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 i wish that mainstream sports would recognize something like that more because when you really look at it, what you're achieving and able to do right now in our sport deserves recognition in mainstream stream sports as, 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 as a remarkable athlete because you've really, you've had a remarkable career and what you're accomplishing now just day by day, you know, going out there riding at Oakland, a very competitive meet against, you know, much younger guys is, is, is a remarkable thing at your age. And it's something that, 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 should get a lot more recognition than it does and i i ho hopefully this video will help some people at least uh my show is not nearly big enough popular enough to to really do that but uh you never know who could see it and and, and realize it because it's well deserved and you're you're a tremendous athlete and a, and, a, and a credit to the sport and a gentleman as well so thank you for coming on john really really appreciate it all right john thanks for having me on your show all right, man, all the best to you. And uh, if, if Ben Diesel or anybody else gets you back to Louisville, you know that we will be rooting real hard in this house for you to get that win because they're, they're, we, we know there was one with your name on it, my man. So Great. Well, I'm very grateful for the support. That means yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll be rooting for it. Um, I'll shut this off now. We'll say goodbye off camera and uh, we'll be good to go. Nobody does it better.